discussion is engaging in productive and profitable online conversations. If you've attended any of these other webinars, uh, you know that this is uh, sort of building on some topics we've discussed previously. Um, my focus tends to be on business to business, but uh, I'm going to give you some examples here also that uh, fall into the business to consumer realm. Uh, strictly uh, as a matter of illustration, because uh, I feel that in these cases uh, that I'm going to show you, the same principles apply to uh, business to business uh, discussions as well. The point of this, uh, uh, this particular uh, webinar is to talk about uh, how we can uh, turn conversations to our advantage in a variety of ways, not, not just through revenue, but also by uh, improving our visibility into the market and uh, improving customer affinity and creating those, those ever important brand ambassadors, which is a topic that we hear about a lot. Uh, if you have questions during the uh, meeting, you can, uh, I'll stop a couple of times to take questions if you're on the phone. If you'd rather enter them by text chat or if you're listening over your computer speakers, feel free to do that and we'll get to questions uh, also over, uh, over the text chat. So um, again, by way of background, I'm the curator of the InfoBoom, a, um, which is a IBM community for uh, mid-sized business leaders. And uh, this is part of our social media series which we've looked at um, a variety of ways to turn this new uh, and very uh, exciting but uh, quite disruptive media to your advantage. Uh, what we're going to talk about here a lot is how we empower customers to become uh, ambassadors and advocates for our brand and uh, turn them into essentially a deputized sales force. And uh, I'm going to start with an example from the consumer realm, but one that is, I think is particularly good. It's one of my favorites. In fact, I, I led my second book with a uh, case study of this company. Uh, it's Fiskars, which is a company that uh, makes cutting tools. You've probably seen their, their famous color ha colored handled uh, shears. They do a, a variety of professional cutting tools, very high quality stuff. And about three years ago they were facing a, um, a problem, which is that the big box retailers were beginning to draw down their inventories of uh, high quality cutting tools and so they had to find some new sales channels and uh, they identified the um, uh, specialty crafting stores as the, as the, the uh, biggest opportunity and uh, they decided to focus in on, uh, on crafting enthusiasts called uh, scrapbookers and if you, if you are a scrapbooker yourself or you know any, you know that they're quite passionate about their, uh, about their craft. And uh, so Fiskars created this community they call the Fisketeers, which are crafting ambassadors and really focused on the scrapbooking community. And the idea was to get the uh, community involved in uh, to, to harness some of the enthusiasm of these people who they knew were uh, proficient users of cutting tools and to get them to sort of spread the word about the quality and the variety of tools that Fiskars uh, offers. Uh, Three years later, well, they, they expected the community would maybe top out at about 500 members. Uh, last I checked, they were up to about 7,000. And it's a, uh, an exercise that has changed the company entirely. Uh, and by the way, it's not strictly an online exercise. There's a whole uh, real world component to the Fisketeers as well. Uh, they hold meetings all around the country. They uh, have uh, a national meeting every year at which they invite uh, the members of these community of, th of this uh, big community, the Fisketeers, to attend and to uh, to swap their tips and to to share their passion. And members, you can see, are quite um, uh, are quite passionate. Some of them p put their Fiskars number on their uh, license plate, uh, or have even had their their Fiskars uh, serial number tattooed on their skin. Um, the idea of the community it's very interesting how they approach it. It's a member-only community. But pretty much anybody who applies can become a member. Uh, but the, the idea that members are, uh, this concept of membership being something exclusive, something that's a privilege, was important. And I think you find that in, in online communities, uh, membership and status within the community is a very important driver of uh, participation. So the way, it, the way it's transformed um, this whole company Um, uh, it, the way it's transformed the company is that uh, everyone who works at Fiskars now recognizes this community of crafters as being a resource for the company as a whole. 
In fact, the engineers who create these cutting tools uh, have now dubbed themselves the Fiskineers. And whenever there is a meeting of the uh, Fisketeers around the country, there's always uh, a Fiskars engineer and a communications person there to capture what's going on because they pick up so many good ideas from listening to these, their most passionate customers. The uh, photo actually at the lower right is a photo that I took of uh, my wife is a Fisketeer and she went to a meeting and came back with just uh, hundreds of dollars worth of giveaways. Uh, they, they really make these people feel special and, and the idea of giving away uh, merchandise to this uh, select group is that uh, they will use it and they will share it by word of mouth with uh, their friends and the uh, value of the community will be multiplied uh, by the, uh, this word of mouth marketing. And it certainly has worked for Fiskars in their, uh, their core goal, which was to increase uh, specialty store sales. In fact, specialty so store sales tripled in the first year that the uh, Fisk Fisketeers were in existence. But they tap into this group now for just about everything. Uh, so the group advises them on new product design, on new stencils. Uh, they help them name products. They help them come up with ideas for new products. Uh, it, it really is sort of a deputized engineering task force and something which is enabled by tapping into the passion that people have for, uh, for a craft. And, and what's really critical here, I think, is uh, a point I want to make about communities in general, is that you, you want to, very few people will rally around a brand. Uh, there are a few brands that, that do uh, inspire passion. I guess Harley Davidson would, would be one of them. But for the most part, people don't rally around a brand. They rally around uh, a, a cause or a, a passion or a pursuit or something that is really important to them. And what Fisketeers, uh, what Fiskars realized is that the leverage of the community was not the Fiskars brand. It was, it, it was uh, scrapbooking. It was crafting. And it was tapping into the passion for crafting and using that to, uh, to aid the brand. So uh, this is a company that's been around, by the way, for, uh, since uh, 1675. And if a company that's been around that long can transform itself through the use of an online community, I, I think just about anybody can. So that's uh, one example of how community can be, uh, can be leveraged for business benefit. Uh, another is by simply giving people an opportunity to come together in, uh, in a way that was not possible before. Uh, this is Bobby Carlton. Bobby Carlton is a public relations professional uh, out of the Boston area. and. Uh, about three years ago, she conceived, I guess it was a little more than two years ago, she conceived of an idea uh, she called Mass Innovation Nights. And the idea was that uh, there were all kinds of small companies that were trying to find uh, customers and trying to find investors. And it, it was very difficult. It was uh, expensive. It was, uh, there was a lot of networking involved. It was who you knew. Uh, it was very difficult for them to find customers who would really help them get traction and get the company off the ground. And so she created this uh, concept of mass innovation nights and it was as low budget an operation as you can imagine. She actually got free space in a museum uh, that was actually looking to build its own profile and get more uh, visitors so it was kind of a win-win from that perspective and uh, uh, she just asked people to uh, co the companies to come in set up a table and show off their products. Uh, she bought a couple of cases of soda. That was her total investment, was a couple of cases of soda. And then created a website and uh, said, come and meet these, uh, these up and coming, these companies that are doing interesting and innovative things. Well, over two years later, Mass Innovation Nights is now drawing uh, six, 700 uh, people at a time. Uh, they're looking at uh, uh, franchising this idea across the United States now into, uh, into other territories as well. And it continues to be a very low budget operation. It's, it's just, uh, she just sets up a place and she creates a meeting place where people can come together. So what's been the benefit to Bobby Carlton? Well, these small companies, when they're looking for someone to do communications for them, uh, they look to her as sort of their, their salvation. You know, she has been, uh, she's played a critical role in their growth and their success. So her business has exploded. She's hired uh, four people now. A five, uh, she's got a five-person company, and they've got more business than they know what to do with. Uh, really all on the basis of bringing together in an innovative way and at a very low cost buyers and sellers. It's something that uh, the 
newspapers and the magazines and the chambers of commerce you know should have thought of this but they didn't it was just uh, so low budget and so and done so simply maybe it was something that they perceived as being beneath them but it wasn't beneath Bobby Carlton and what she did was provide a very valuable service now there's no advertising involved uh, all of the uh, uh, the promotion is spread through a, a website and Twitter in fact if you go to massino.com uh, mass inno.com, you'll see that the announcements of the new Mass Innovation Nights typically get uh, four or five hundred tweets, and that's really what's drawing the audience. So, uh, for Bobby, the uh, the investment was was negligible, and the business payoff has been tremendous because she was providing using the internet. She was providing a service to bring people together who could not have been brought together otherwise. Another great example, I think, of finding value through creating a conversation. So a lot of this, um, the, the buzzword that you hear a lot about this is word of mouth. And that is that each piece of content contributed online by a consumer can be used as a building block to create a sense of community that amplifies the authentic value of user-generated con content. The idea that uh, people who are satisfied tend to want to tell others about it. In fact, there's research to support that, that uh, satisfied customers are about three times more likely to tell people about their experience as uh, dissatisfied customers. So if you can get people to express their satisfaction or their enthusiasm for your product through whatever means are available to you, uh, you can amplify the effect of your, uh, your marketing budget uh, because you turn those people into street-level marketers. So word of mouth is becoming very real. It's expected to be about a $3 billion market this year, uh, marketing spending on word of mouth marketing, and uh, growing very rapidly, uh, largely because the tools that are available now are so sophisticated that will enable people to share their experiences. Uh, one of the great advantages of word of mouth marketing is that it, it is an annuity. You know, traditional advertising has been thought of as being a campaign, and the campaign has a limited uh, period of time. That it, that it runs, typically 13, 26 weeks, and then, and then it's over. And then we sort of harvest our leads or we try to, to build momentum with the uh, business that comes in. Uh, but the payoff is, is mainly at the front end. With traditional, with uh, word of mouth mar marketing, user generated content, the payoff actually comes at the back end. Uh, as word of mouth builds, as people share information with each other, the value of the community grows. So the more activity there is, the more people are telling each other about their experience, the greater the value of word of mouth marketing. And c uh, conversely, the less you have to spend on it. You can reduce your traditional advertising budget because more of your advertising is being done by your, your satisfied customers. Now, of course, if you don't have satisfied customers, that's a different problem. But I'm assuming that most people on this call uh, are uh, do have happy customers and do create good products and so if you can put those customers to work for you you can actually reduce your marketing spend over time as uh, word of mouth takes hold the cycle of engagement uh, moves from low engagement to high engagement and that is that you know a visitor may pass by come to a site to read a review and uh, purchase a product and then contribute a review of the product themselves uh, the more reviews are posted, the more visitors are attracted by the content. The uh, volume of reviews tends to reinforce the value of the reviews itself. So you've all seen this. If you go on Amazon, you know, you'll see uh, uh, Amazon is an early pioneer in this area. You can evaluate uh, products based upon other people's recommendations. And Amazon allows you to uh, sort uh, products by the um, strength of the customer review. Well, this becomes very powerful because the more reviews you accumulate, the more uh, customer approval there is, uh, the more people tend to weigh in and want to participate and add their voice to the community. So as these customers uh, become uh, involved with your company, as they feel rewarded by contributing their reviews uh, and contributing to the value of uh, th that other people will find in the product and sharing their positive experiences, it tends to attract more customers. Uh, Certainly, if I was going to buy a product on Amazon and there were two reviews, uh, I would be less inclined to, 
to believe those reviews than if there were 50. And if there are 50 five-star reviews, then that's much more likely to be a product that I'm going to purchase. Well, the same thing works in the B2B context. So if your customers are have a, a forum to express their satisfaction, it tends to draw other customers and it creates uh, more value for you. Uh, it makes your product appear more value in the uh, valuable in the minds of prospective other customers. Uh, this lowers your cost per lead. The inbound, uh, this is what's called inbound marketing. Uh, we talked about this in an earlier webinar. Inbound marketing is an entirely new kind of marketing that has been enabled by uh, the internet. Uh, I guess you could say that inbound marketing has existed in, uh, in the past in sort of drive-by marketing, uh, store displays and billboards and such. But inbound marketing has uh, really been turbocharged by the availability of, um, uh, uh, by search, in search in particular, but also by referral links as people drive traffic, uh, send uh, links that uh, send their, uh, their friends and their family members and people they influence to uh, products and to destinations on the web that they find valuable. And so as your inbound marketing increases, the average cost per lead decreases. And then if you take the slide two slides ago, uh, showing how word of mouth grows over time, you actually see your marketing budget uh, decline over time as increasingly customers links and your search engine performance takes care of what you used to have to pay for. Uh, this is HubSpot data showing that the average cost per lead uh, of an inbound uh, marketing uh, of inbound marketing is about uh, a third of that of traditional outbound marketing. It doesn't mean that outbound marketing isn't valuable. It certainly still does have value. But this is an area, uh, I think, of great cost leverage uh, that begins with search engine optimization but really is driven by quality content that uh, and quality products that convince people to share their experiences with others and that results in c leads coming in over the transom. Uh, anything you can do to get your customers participating with you is part of the cycle of creating word of mouth marketing. So. Uh, you know, submit a photo, uh, take a poll, write a review, answer or ask a question, share a story. Anything that you can do, those like buttons that we've seen popping up everywhere, you know, uh, Facebook's brilliant move last year to diversify the like button and make it possible for uh, anybody to, uh, any website to participate in the Facebook network. And so when someone clicks a like button on your website, they are communicating to their uh, network of friends, and the average Facebook member has about 130 friends, they are communicating the fact that they have endorsed uh, what they saw on that page, and then that becomes a source of, uh, of uh, secondary traffic for you. Uh, but really asking people to share experiences, you know, a lot of content, we hear a lot about content marketing these days and about consumer-generated marketing. A lot of consumer-generated marketing is just getting people to share stories, uh, to, to uh, invoke uh, feelings to uh, create memories that make them want to tell other people about their story. Maybe it's been their, you know, the first experience they have with a car, or uh, the first time they used a particular computer, or maybe they've been buying your laptops for the last 15 years and they've found them to be incredibly reliable. Uh, what can you do on your, uh, in your online presence to make it possible for people to share those kinds of stories? Um, about Three years ago, there was a company called Grand Central that created a novel idea for a, um, a, a single phone number that enabled people to uh, consolidate all of their phone numbers in onto a, uh, into just one number that rings through to whatever other phones they designate. Uh, this company was purchased for $95 million by Google, and the product uh, still exists. It's called Google Voice now. It's a core Google offering and a very useful service if you haven't tried it. One of the things that Grand Central did that was particularly innovative, I thought, was they created a web a page on their site where they enabled people to share their thoughts, uh, to to share their experiences with Grand Central's product. Anybody could share, could post any review, and all reviews were 
aggregated on that page, both positive and negative. The only reviews that were screened were, were those that used offensive language. But there were about, I'd say, 90% of the reviews were positive and about 10% were negative. Actually, the negative reviews helped to reinforce the value of the positive reviews because it lent legitimacy to the whole exercise. And so when people came to Grand Central, they were uh, directed to this page that showed that thousands of other people had tried this product and were recommending it. And that created a, um, uh, a, a safety factor. Uh, people felt that, well, this is something I want to get in on this too because obviously so many other people are having a positive experience. So you shouldn't fear uh, enabling people to share uh, their experiences, even though you may get the occasional negative review. Uh, that actually helps to reinforce the value of the positive reviews. Uh, in the case of uh, Petco, consumer reviews and consumer generated question and answers lead directly to increased sales and fewer returns. And Petco rewards its top contributors with special badges. So uh, the uh, VP of e-commerce at Petco says the customers who write reviews are more engaged with the site. They come back more often. Uh, their goals are to increase the content on the website, which adds to the value, and also to build loyalty. If they take the time to write, people tend to come back and see what others say. And that's a key point. If you can get people to contribute to your site, whether it be your website, your Facebook page, your LinkedIn page, whatever uh, may work for you, when people contribute, they want to come back and they see what others see what others have said. So you tend to get repeat traffic, and traffic builds on itself. So uh, the when you can, can build wish lists or create gift registries, uh, send a friend an email, fill out a survey, anything that makes uh, that encourages your customers to uh, to share an experience or share an opinion is actually an incentive for them to come back and see how others are uh, are voting or what opinions others are sharing as well. Community tends to build community. And in the case of Petco, and, and many websites are doing this now, particularly retail sites, are giving people badges that they can embed on their blogs or their websites that uh, show the level of activity they've had with the community, their contributions, and that celebrate their contributions. Now this works in B2B as well. In, in, uh, this is a case of LabVIEW, which is a product produced by National Instruments. This is a very high-end um, software product that is used for, uh, for, um, uh, by engineers and uh, for a CAD CAM type of design and uh, costs you know, many, many thousands of dollars. Uh, what they have done is turn to their community for their development ideas. So they've created this, uh, this uh, idea forum where people can share their uh, recommendations for enhancements to LabVIEW products. And then the recommendations can be voted up or down. So you see in this case, this, uh, this particular a su suggestion has received 363 kudo kudos, which uh, puts it actually at the top of the rank of all the suggestions that have been solicited during that period. Uh, there's a likelihood, very high likelihood that this suggestion will be incorporated into the product. And in fact, uh, National Instruments has uh, reduced the cycle time of its new uh, product development, of its uh, maintenance releases and it's increased the number of new features that they're able to add into the releases because there's less trial and error because they're getting so many of their ideas directly from their customers. That naturally increases customer satisfaction and increases customers uh, recommending the product to itself to each other. So the community actually becomes an asset to the company not only in terms of product development but in terms of uh, customers of the uh, community becoming a uh, uh, a source of value for other members who can share, for example, software code or downloads with each other. Uh, the more they can, uh, the more downloads that accumulate in the community, the more value the LabVIEW product uh, accumulates itself. I'm going to stop here at this point and just ask if there are any questions right now. Uh, let's go on to some other opportunities. Um, this is a slide I actually used in an earlier presentation, but it applies here, and I want to reinforce it. Uh, you can use some uh, communities to uh, some online tools simply to identify opportunities because people ask them. Uh, people are always out there online asking for advice and recommendation. On Twitter, there is a hashtag called RFP. There's actually a, a Twitter account that consolidates RFP. 
uh, requests into a single Twitter account, and these are all uh, essentially invitations to bid on different kinds of contracts. Uh, go into a LinkedIn group and you'll see all over the place, you'll see people asking questions, seeking expertise. This kind of question, I'm operating a new data center in, in New Jersey with an evaporative cooling plant and is looking for green alternatives to conventional biocides. Any suggestions? Well, if that's your business, it's an opportunity for you certainly to recommend um, either your product or recommend products that the people that someone might uh, might uh, want to pursue. Uh, I should emphasize that when you are responding to questions like this, people are not looking for sales pitches; they're looking for help. And if you can recommend the uh, uh, the features that they should look for in a product, you're actually going to have a more credible experience with them than if you go in trying to trying to sell them your product. Uh, Quora, which is one of the hot new question and answer sites, is, is full of questions like this. What are some green marketing or environmental PR companies in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area? Uh, just go into the topic, uh, different topical areas on Quora and look for the questions people are asking. Lots of them are uh, people looking for products or services that they need for their business. Uh, on Twitter, you can set up a keyword filter such as uh, this one I set up, does anyone know printers? So uh, it's a simple keyword filter that looks for the phrase, does anyone know, that is contextually followed by the word printer. And this is just a, a little snip I took actually this morning from the RSS feed uh, showing in, in this little clip here about five different opportunities for a service to um, who would be monitoring these questions to uh, to find a customer. These customers, these people are actually asking uh, these questions because they're looking for uh, businesses. They're looking to do business with someone. So you can monitor these kinds of keywords on Twitter, capture them in your RSS feeder, and just go in occasionally and look at the activity that's accumulated and see if there are opportunities for you to either uh, make a sale or to refer them to a service or a business partner in your area who may be able to satisfy their needs. Very simple thing to do. Uh, and having standing keyword searches as RSS feeds, which uh, most search engines now support keyword searches as RSS feeds, enables is much more efficient than doing searches uh, because the searches are captured uh, persistently and every time you open your RSS reader you'll see the, uh, the latest results. You can just scan down them and see if, see if there are opportunities for you. Again, I'm getting some background noise. If you're not in, uh, planning to ask a question at the moment, I'd ask you to please put yourself on mute. For market research, um, asking questions. Now, LinkedIn is a great resource for business-to-business -business marketers in particular uh, because it is so professionally oriented and because the people who are there all have uh, profiles which link back to uh, all, all of their activities link back to their profiles. So you get very little waste. You get very little spam in LinkedIn because everything is linked back to a profile. So you can get value out of LinkedIn by answering questions. You can also get value out of asking questions. Uh, and I'll show you uh, later a, an example of somebody who uh, who has done um, who uses LinkedIn effectively. Uh, the question answering features on LinkedIn effectively for his business, but also uh, some people find that they the, the best way to harvest new business is to ask questions. So to seek advice from professionals, and then those professionals may actually become business partners uh, for you. People that you would never meet otherwise, you'd never have a chance to meet otherwise, you can now meet because you can express a, an interest, a common need, and that serves as an introduction point and that may be a business partner, it may be a vendor, uh, you may be the one answering the question, you may be a potential supplier. There are people on LinkedIn who have answered uh, many thousands of questions. It's really remarkable. You look at the, uh, the all-time leader on LinkedIn is this guy Dave Maskin who has answered 42,000 questions on LinkedIn. And uh, there are other people who are in the tens of thousands. Now why do they do this? Um, they obviously there must be some business value they say, see to it. To some extent maybe they just enjoy uh, sharing, but really this is a way of expressing expertise. It's a way of spreading your, uh, your skills around to a wider audience. And LinkedIn encourages this because LinkedIn has leaderboards in all of its uh, different groups, and of course there are thousands of groups on LinkedIn, 
Uh, each one of them will show you who have been the most active contributors to the group. So again, this idea of uh, celebrating uh, success, celebrating your most active contributors, really, really works. And uh, those people do this because there is business benefit they get out of it. They get business leads. They develop expertise. They develop a reputation as being a go-to person uh, for, uh, for the area of specialty that they have. Now, uh, Dave Maskin's a particularly interesting guy. He's not an easy guy to get hold of, but he has published some, uh, some um, of, his, uh, uh, of his secrets. And what he does is, is very interesting, actually. It's an unusual business. He is uh, hired by companies at trade shows to do a specialized uh, task, which is he will create names out of wire. So he takes a piece of wire, and working with uh, simple tools in his hands, he fashions names. And then he'll give the name, the, the, the product, to the person in the booth. Now, before he goes to a trade show, uh, so a company will contract with Dave to be sort of uh, an attraction at their booth at the trade show. Before he goes to the trade show, he joins a LinkedIn group associated with the show to let people know that he'll be there. And he lets his LinkedIn network, which is quite large, with 42,000 responses, he obviously has a, a very large LinkedIn network, he'll let those people know that he's going to be at the trade show. A lot of people are interested in meeting with this guy because they want to know what drives him. Uh, he goes there effen effectively acting as an employee of the company, even though he is a contractor. Uh, he walks around the floor and gets other exhibitors to um, uh, tells them about this service that he offers for free at the booth, uh, invites other exhibitors to come over and to get their name done in, uh, in wire form. And then after the show, he thanks everyone in the LinkedIn group for uh, stopping by, and, uh, and he mentions the client's business and, uh, and the website. So he's doubling down, really, on, the, on the, um, uh, the value of LinkedIn, both as a pre-event and a post-event form of, um, of uh, a lead generation. Uh, the value to the company that hires him is that while he is fashioning the name out of wire, uh, the attendee is standing there in the booth watching and waiting for, uh, the, for the project to be finished, and that's a lead generation opportunity. He asks for their business card, salesperson comes over, starts a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and then attendees carry their wire names around the show floor, driving even more attendees to the booth. So this is a, a case of doing something remarkable, using LinkedIn as a catalyst to get people to come and see this remarkable thing he's doing, and uh, then, uh, then um, uh, allowing word of mouth to do its magic from there. Can you see the screen right now? I'm, my sharing preview window has turned blank. You, you do see the screen. OK, great. Um, LinkedIn has become a, uh, a foundry for business networking uh, customers. It really is a, it's a very different kind of network from Facebook. Facebook has lots and lots of, uh, of uh, uh, applications, and it's a, a kind of a free-for-all. Uh, LinkedIn has only limited relationships with limited uh, uh, business partners, uh, but those partners can bring considerable value to the LinkedIn community and can, can tap into this community of over 100 million business professionals right now. So for B2B uh, companies, uh, in a case like Hoover's, where they're bringing a location-based uh, business network functionality to LinkedIn customers, so uh, people who are members of LinkedIn can actually uh, tap into a, uh, a mobile application that shows them information about uh, customers that they may, uh, prospects that they may be visiting. Uh, this is a, a case where LinkedIn adds value to uh, its members through these selective relationships that it has with third parties, such as SlideShare and, uh, and such as TripIt, uh, business-oriented social networking services. So offering apps through LinkedIn uh, or using apps through LinkedIn, they have a variety of very, uh, very powerful apps that will enable you to learn more about your customers. For example, the TripIt application on LinkedIn is a, a, a travel sharing app. So when I plan a trip, my information about my trip is shared with others in my network and can be also searched by uh, using LinkedIn, uh, uh, LinkedIn uh, events, the, um, 
the, the uh, what's called LinkedIn Signal, which is a search engine for LinkedIn. So you can actually see people who are going to be in your area, who uh, uh, customers that you may want to meet, uh, prospects you may want to meet. You can find their location via the uh, services like TripIt. So this is really emerging, I think, for business to business as the uh, as the social network of choice, because they've provided uh, focus so much on adding value to the. Uh, uh, that is specific to the business customers. Is try to create multiple touch points with your customers. And this is a, a matter, I, I think, of, of uh, once someone uh, interacts with you on your website, creates some sort of, a, um, uh, uh, of an interaction, whether it be a review or a comment or they share a story, uh, really use that as a jumping off point to continue to further that uh, that interaction so that you are uh, you're deepening that relationship. So Home Depot Canada notifies customers through social alerts that their review has been approved. So when you submit a review <coughs> at, at Home Depot, uh, your review does not automatically appear on the site. It has to go through a review process. When it's approved, then an email goes out to the customer saying the review has been approved. That's another incentive for that person to come back to uh, the Home Depot site. And, uh, and to continue, now that this email connection has been created, to continue a dialogue with the customer. If you know from past uh, seminars, I've t talked about the importance of email creating these persistent connections. Once you capture an email address, someone is giving you permission to message them, and that's a very important permission still to have. Uh, use that sparingly, but use that as a way to continue to uh, to provide value points to them, to build upon that relationship, to build upon their involvement with your community by highlighting things that go on in the community that, that may interest them directly. Uh, and again, as we said, reviews are, uh, are a big driver of involvement because once people contribute to a review, they want to see the status of that review and how other people may be reacting to it. A service that uh, that I use that does this very well. I'm just using today's webinar, for example, is uh, is Eventbrite, which if you're putting on an event, um, taking registrations through Eventbrite enables people to share their uh, their plans to attend the event through their social network. So when they sign up for the event, Eventbrite gives them multiple opportunities to share immediately to share on Facebook and to share on Twitter, and then they uh, uh, the order confirmation is permission for them to deliver a message into your inbox. And so there are actually multiple messages that come into your inbox. They will send you an immediate confirmation of your order, but they also send you reminders uh, before the event and the day of the event. And then after the event, they will send you uh, a, uh, a survey form, if you wish, or they will send a summary email, if you wish. All of this is part of the process of, of maintaining this dialogue, of keeping your name in front of the customer in a way that is relevant to a content uh, item that is important to them. The customers come to a, an online event like a webinar because they want the content. What Eventbrite is doing is really leveraging their participation in the content as a way to create multiple uh, touch points and an ongoing dialogue with them that keeps your brand in front of the company. Uh, this is something that you can outsource by using a service like Eventbrite. No, they're not the only ones that do this. There are other services like this, uh, but they're, uh, this is one of the best known that leverages all, uh, puts all the different social tools to effect so that when someone puts up their hand and says, I'm interested, I want to attend this event, it gives them the opportunity to share that fact with, uh, with everybody in their network. Uh, th this is a page from Epson. And Epson is one of a growing number of companies that is providing actually customer reviews on their um, on their website. And you know this was seen as com almost heretical a few years ago, the idea that you would let people rate your products on your website. But it has been uh, it's a growing practice because the results of it have been so phenomenal. So in the case of uh, of Epson, they find that their uh, their sell through, their repeat visitors. Uh, their likelihood of actually converting a sales, their conversion rates went way up when they started enabling people to review their products directly on their website. And of course, not every product gets five-star reviews, but most of them are in the four-star range, and that's a high comfort level for their customers. Uh, so this is a form of consumer validation. Their customers are validating directly on their website that these products are good to buy, 
and that has business payoff for uh, for Epson. You know, if you have confidence in your products, then this is a great way to enable customers to validate their own confidence in your products. Uh, even if you get bad reviews, there's value in that as well. So if your product is badly rated, uh, that actually is a warning sign for you. That means maybe you you should you can fix something early before it becomes a bigger problem, or maybe it's inventory that you shouldn't be carrying. Maybe it's a product that should be taken off the market. So there is value in negative reviews as well. The idea really is that any feedback is good, and for the most part, again, people who share ratings are inclined to share positive ratings with each other. Another company that does this, uh, next slide, is uh, L.L. Bean. L.L. Bean's been doing this actually for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, if you look through the L.L. Bean website, you'll see that almost all their products are rated four stars and above. Now, what's, what's the value of that? It's, it's consumer endorsement that, uh, that these products are a good value. And, of course, today we increasingly um, want to hear from each other. We turn to each other for advice, not to the experts. And uh, this kind of peer advice increasingly is the stuff that drives repeat sales. Uh, content sells, and uh, this really is something, a theme that we've talked about through uh, the several of these webinars, is the idea that, um, if you'll excuse me here. Content content sells because it creates trust, and trust is something that's uh, harder and harder to come by these days. So when um, uh, trusted content, that which establishes you as an expert, is uh, is increasingly the only way you can get the attention of the customer. So you get companies like uh, a painting company that does a magazine for professional painting contractors. Or you get uh, Marketo, which has its, which did a partnership with Jellyvision uh, to do a version of the You Don't Know Jack game for marketers. And this kind of creative marketing, which also has uh, professional value, is driving the f people finding is driving uh, more uh, responses, uh, higher lead generation than they could get through any other form of conventional marketing, because of course people are filtering that stuff out. But they are fi we're finding that when they double down on their uh, content marketing, on delivering value and creating trust, it tends to build upon it, uh, itself. So McKinsey found that traditional marketers typically spend about 60% of their budgets on paid media and about 20% on content creation. Marketers that are embracing custom content devote about 30% of their marketing budgets to paid media and 50% to content. You know, I work on Procter and Gamble's. Uh, I serve on Procter and Gamble's digital advisory board, and and this is what they are going through. They are going moving very strongly to uh, an earned media uh, approach to marketing, in which content and customer endorsements are selling the products because they find that's much more powerful when customers talk about the products than when uh, Procter and Gamble does. Move on to the next slide, please. So uh, another example of content driving commerce, I think is a particularly uh, creative one, uh, again in the B2B realm, this is a company called Element 14 that does products for engineers. Um, the Ben Heck Show is a, uh, it's a hacking uh, video series in which this guy creates some uh, very uh, uh, innovative uh, hacks, mainly of hardware. Uh, people can submit uh, visitors to the site or members of the site can submit challenges to him and ask him to create custom hacks for them. This is one example of uh, he created a see-through shirt for Halloween by mounting a video screen on the front and a camera on the back so that it uh, created the, uh, the impression that you were able to see through him. But what Element 14 does, again their electronics distributor, is when Ben creates these marvelous innovative hacks, they also take people to a landing page where they have all the materials that he builds, that he uses to build that product uh, available on that landing page. And in fact, their sales have increased uh, about 15% in the six months they've been doing this. Their sales directly from the Ben Heck page.
page. I uh, have uh, they, they believe that Ben Heck has driven about a 15% overall increase in sales because of the popularity of this video series and the fact that engineers who watch it uh, want to do this themselves. Uh, engineers love to tinker and so they want to build something just like this and they can get all the parts uh, conveniently in one package at element 14. Next slide please. Uh, this is uh, an example, uh, another example of community where uh, you know, very often you can find that community already exists out there and you aren't even aware of it. Uh, and the people will, will self-organize communities that you then can tap into. It may be around your product or it may be around the market that you're in. If, uh, if you're in the best possible situation, you have that like what, um, uh, what uh, Nikon experienced when they went into Flickr, which is a big uh, photo sharing site, and found that there were thousands and thousands of people who had self-organized into discussion groups around Nikon cameras. Well, Nikon has used this as a forum to uh, for peer-to-peer uh, -peer selling, but also for product development. So they have harnessed some of the most enthusiastic members of the Nikon groups on Flickr, and they are using them to help them develop and test uh, new photo equipment. Uh, these are experts. These are people who really understand the products that they're using. They're people who are passionate already about Nikon cameras. They were already in a place. They were already in Flickr, and it was just a matter of Nikon reaching out and contacting them and giving them a um, giving them a connection point. Uh, Nikon did a photo photo contest at one point where uh, there uh, you had to take a photo with the Nikon camera. It had to be uploaded to Flickr, and then there was a judging process, and the the top photos were. Uh, incorporated into a uh, printed insert in Business Week. Now, for uh, photo enthusiasts, for amateur photographers, this is uh, nirvana, getting your photo published in Business Week. It was a way for Nikon to really tap into the enthusiasm of its customer base and to generate word-of-mouth marketing and, and excitement uh, and, and to, again, bring these people closer into a community. Moving ahead to the next slide. This is a Care One community a company that uh, specializes in debt relief. Now, obviously, a lot of people are concerned with debt relief these days. It's a, it's a hot topic. Um, it's not something that's easy to get people to talk about. So their challenge was getting people to, uh, uh, to put up their hands and say, yes, I have debt problems and I need some help. Uh, what they found is that by creating communities where people could talk anonymously, uh, where they were staffed with experts from Care One, their employees who are experts on uh, solving debt problems, that if this would create a connection point and the customers would become uh, more involved with the community. They'd find more value, their awareness of Care One would increase and their appreciation of Care One would increase, and uh, so would their conversion. So if you go on to the next slide, the Care One community uh, is actually driving a lot of leads. This is a comparison of uh, people who have uh, who have participated in the community and then uh, signed up for the plan and made the first payment. Those are the two critical business metrics that Care One has, signing up for a debt relief plan and making the first, uh, first payment. Uh, people who have uh, participated in the community uh, have a, uh, a very high likelihood. Uh, they have a, a almost 200% higher likelihood of signing up for a plan or, and making their first payment. But they have, if they have filled out a lead form after participating in the community, then those numbers skyrocket to about 700%. So this is a business payoff that is directly attributable to the value that the community brings. They get people to participate in the community. They fill out the lead form. If you can get people to admit that they have a debt problem and to fill out a lead form asking for help, then the likelihood of converting that person into a customer is much, much higher. Again, the whole thing is driven from the community. It's experts at Care One who are freely sharing their expertise. It is peers who are telling each other how they solve their debt problem, and that creates value, uh, additional affinity for what Care One does. Next slide, please. In the case of SAP, um, the community is a huge value add to the company on almost every level, everything from product co-development to peer-to-peer uh, -peer support, which is a big money saver. Uh, but really, it's a uh, the community itself adds value to the uh, to the company. So one of the reasons, one of the, s the 
factors that influences people's decision to go with SAP versus another vendor is that there's this huge community of about two million people who are available for support and to share ideas and to, to uh, share their solutions and to uh, uh, download code, share code with each other. So the more people who accumulate in the community, the larger the community actually, the higher the value uh, to SAP. And this is a critical selling point to SAP now. The fact that so many other people are out there available and, and able to help you uh, to solve your problems. SAP probably does communities better than, than any B2B company I've seen. Next slide, please. Uh, community recognition is a powerful motivator. Uh, we see this on consumer sites like uh, Yelp, where there are all kinds of badges and levels that people can reach. If, if anyone has ever used Foursquare, you know that there are dozens of different badges that are associated with, with activities. People like to accumulate these things. There's no cash value to them. They have no economic value. But simply having the badges that accumulate next to your name, next to your profile, raises your visibility in the community, and that's a motivator. Well, that works in B2B as well. So if you move on to the next slide, um, uh, by the way, uh, competition is another uh, component of that. Uh, people compete. Essentially, when they're accumulating, accumulating these badges, they're actually competing against each other, uh, raising their profiles. And you see this on LinkedIn. I mentioned that LinkedIn groups spotlight the members who are most active. It really is a form of competition. The, uh, the more questions you can answer, the more contribute you contribute to the group, the higher your profile in the group. This is a key dynamic of online communities, and it works very, very well. Now, for uh, in, in a B2B context, it works in, uh, in a community like Rigid Forum, which is for plumbing, woodworking, construction, and construction professionals. And it's a tools forum in which uh, the there's a very large body of discussions, over 325,000 discussion posts that have been uh, added there over the last decade. But also, the top uh, most active members of this community are an advisory board for uh, Rigid the Toolmaker. So Rigid actually brings these people out uh, once a year to its headquarters and consults with them for advice on, uh, on its product line and where it should take its business. It's free advice from uh, your, your best customers, your most enthusiastic customers. It works for product development. The next slide, please. Uh, this is Top Coder, which is a company that uh, is a very interesting model. They are a software, software development company that doesn't employ a single software developer. All of their development, they do uh, primarily custom development work, big projects, government-sized projects. Uh, all of their development work is done through a community of programmers who compete, and there are over 40 competitions, different kinds of programming competitions going on uh, all through the year, including physical events, uh, at which people compete to solve problems. And when, you, uh, when your problem is chosen uh, as the best, uh, whether it's by the community vote or by top coder itself, there are uh, financial payoffs uh, for associated with that, and some people make six-figure incomes actually working uh, uh, through top coder. But also, there is this visibility. So this fellow here, DCP, has the highest rating of all developers currently in the top coder community. Uh, there's a lot of incentive for him to, uh, to continue to participate in these competitions, uh, to continue to uh, sustain his number one position. Obviously, a lot of benefits to him that come out of this in the terms of, uh, of uh, contracts, uh, job offers. Um, there's a lot of professional gain that he gets by being recognized in this elite professional community. Top Coder gets the work done for very little cost. So instead of paying programmers full-time salaries, they're able to outsource this to a community of people. They even do programming competitions for, uh, for high school students. Uh, so they're cultivating programmers from a very early age and making them part of the Top Coder community and keeping them engaged with this, uh, this site, this community, as a way to grow their careers. Uh, you can monetize communities through uh, uh, through other means as well. Uh, this is SpiceWorks, which is a uh, community of uh, people who use a software tool, a very sophisticated network management software tool that is given away for free. Um, and then the community is monetized. SpiceWorks makes all its money off of the community and none of its money off of software. So there are point systems uh, that reward people for participation. 
uh, there are all kinds of ways that they use to keep the, uh, the members of the community engaged. But the sponsors are uh, virtually every high-tech company, every major IT company now is working with Spiceworks because they get so much value out of this community. So in the case of, um, uh, for example, uh, CDW is, uh, is, is spending uh, uh, more than six figures, uh, you know, six figures a year on different uh, lead generation activities within the community. Uh, yielding a very high ROI because when they're trying to reach systems management professionals, this is the perfect community for them to use. So uh, this is another case of where the uh, a community of like-minded people can be monetized by selling um, sponsorships and, and other features to companies that want to reach that community. Moving ahead, and just down to our, our last couple of examples here, uh, Sodexo has uh, stopped advertising uh, recruitment advertising this is a company that hires 5,000 people a year in the U.S. alone. Uh, they've moved all of their recruitment over to Twitter and other social media, and uh, the reason is that it shortcuts much of the uh, uh, waste of recruiting. There is a lot of waste in recruiting because of the need to qualify applicants and to go through a front-end screening process. Uh, they do mo most of this now on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Facebook, where they identify potential recruits on the social networks, they engage with them on the networks, and then uh, by the time they move into the recruiting funnel, they know them much better. They are getting a much higher quality of applicant uh, at the top of the funnel. It's uh, their number of, um, uh, the traffic to the career side is up 180 percent in the last two years. They've completely eliminated recruitment advertising costs, and they are, and they've cut the uh, time required to hire a new employee by about 25 percent. And that's it for my prepared presentation. Um, we're right at the, uh, the top of the hour, but if there are any questions, uh, I'd be glad to take them now.